with Lifestyle and with Ruthless in particular, what did you see about each label that you saw made it particularly successful and that you were able to use for yourself later on? Um, I know that watching these two companies, I know that you had to have finance to have success in this business. That, that you know, everybody thinks that you can just be the dopest MC or the dopest producer, but it really takes uh, all pistons firing at the same time. It takes the team, it takes management, it takes your lawyer, it takes the producer and the artist to be on the same page. So being behind the scenes, um, I watched. I just I just watched. I watched Battle Cat and Dana Dane do, do Dana's record. I watched. Um, you know some of the classics. I got to work with uh, with Howard Johnson and see people that had made hit records, um, be around and watch watching those guys work. You're like, okay, I'm taking this in. What it takes to be a successful label from Lifestyle and from Ruthless. I was like, how will I make my own label? How will I be able to do this? I got to get the money. I know I can rap. I know I can make beats now. Okay, then that's where it kicks into like, okay, what did they do? What was the success of Easy? He trusted in Jerry. No matter what happened in the end, there wouldn't be, we wouldn't see some of the success of gangster rap if he wouldn't have trusted Jerry Heller. It would have right. still been at the swap meet. It would have still been, it wouldn't have been the uh, phenomenon that we know. So uh, I just learned that you really have to handle your business, man, and, and, and uh, have a vision and execute it. Not, not just wanting to make music just to make it and be like, uh, I can do it. <laughs> but really having a vision to execute and, and you know, see, be able to change lives at the same time, too. I watched that with Easy, like how he took Bone and, like, you took these guys from Cleveland and you could just take something and mold it and make it into something, a household name. And that's the power that we have once, you know, people say, like, put me on. Once you get on, like, everybody that we know, we see them get put on by someone else that they believe in. It's like, once you make it, okay, 50's on, so now we're going to listen to Lloyd Banks or Yale because he says so. Or, what do you know, just that type of uh, well, pass on, you know? I think those are important things because one, I think a lot of people forget that it's the music business and mm -hmm. that it's not just the creation of the music mm -hmm. because we both know and have seen time and time again talented artists that either didn't have the right label, didn't have the right team, didn't have the right single. There's so many things that mm -hmm. have to work all at the same time in order for you to be successful. And then I also think it's on top of that, you have to have the good creative team and the people creatively <clears throat> to push you. So back to, I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but back to like with Cocaine Early working on your first album, the self-titled album, what was it about the two of you guys that made you guys work so well together, do you think? Um, you know, I, we will, I will credit this, what we were creating at the time, which even caught the attention of Snoop and everyone else which is why they call cocaine to come do hooks, is that there was this chemistry that we had. And, you know, uh, uh, cocaine is cavi once it's cooked up. My name is cavi because cavi is the rock form. of. of so that's how we looked at it. We call ourselves the product. So it's like, yo, when we got in the room, we start doing something that a lot of people weren't doing back then, which was, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of common now, but we would flip oldies. You know what I mean? So we would take an Osley Brother hook, and that's what cocaine is known for, flipping a hook or something and changing it to some street words, you know what I'm saying, I'm so hood, I'm so good, you know what I mean, whatever. And that was just our chemistry. We would just get in the, in the lab and we would put up something. He would be like, hey, bro, we weren't afraid. We were fearless. We weren't afraid to try things. And we were uh, all in a group called a Pimp Clinic up under 187 and Above the Law. So we were doing a lot of writing and a lot of uh, creative things for the Above the Law projects. So a lot of people don't know that as well, that I was a writer. I mean, you probably know, but if you look... You're a credit person, so Hunter, you know. Hunter Spokes, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so those records, um, and that's, once again, that's how I became Cavi, because I was Chaos at first, and then there was another guy out there named Chaos, but KMG came, you know, from Above the Laws, who named me Cavi R. That's who mm. named me Cavi, so a lot of people, rest in peace to KMG. Um, but, yeah, we would come in, I would come in the studio, fresh off the block, man, with, with bars, you know, just a peachy folder full of flows and just flows and shit, and they'd be like, hey, that little dude hard. I'm like, yeah, but I'd already... I was already seasoned at that point, and um, you know they. You wouldn't think that I would go from. This is another thing. I know we could talk about it, but like going from that to end up working with Macy Gray or CeeLo, like the contrast of well, that's the whole gangster rap thing. Yeah, yeah. You know. that, that was definitely we were going to get to. <laughs> but I think it's important too, since we're mentioning a lot of people. I think that don't get a lot of shine, and you know I. I'm real cool with all the Above the Law family, and I went to KMG, rest in peace, his funeral and everything, and mm -hmm. 
that was a, a sad and powerful time, but I wanted you, since he named you, to explain the potency of KMG, because a lot of people, I think, as time has passed, we've kind of gotten away from acknowledging the greatness that he brought to the game. Man, Kev was so articulate. It was the pen. When they did records, Hutch, you know, Hutch produced all the Above the Law albums. But um, even, you know, prior to me and Coca or Trig, any of us that came in and helped out, Kev was the base of the records. Kev kicked off. I remember hearing, I'll say, Black Superman. Like, we were there. We were all in the studio. Just like, and to see that beat come on and like, not anymore. You know, you hear that, you're like, Hutch, can we go downstairs and you come back and hear that beat? Like, oh. One of the two inch spinning, you're like, oh shit. And we're like, oh, what is this gonna be? Like, you know, the beat is out of here. It's like, what the fuck is this gonna be? Kev sit down, roll up some chronic, roll up his chronic, you know what I'm saying? And sit there. And Kev, I feel like Kev started off every Above the Law record. Like, he, even if Hutch rapped first, the first verse, Kev is the one who started the song off. Like, his verse was that potency. So, like, um, like I said, just very articulate, man. Like, one of the, one of the dopest MCs on the West Coast that people probably wouldn't even probably see that, but if you listen to all the lyrics and the things that he said. Oh yeah, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. He was ahead of his time, man, <laughs> come on, man. And I think too, I got uh, fortunate to spend a lot of time with all of them, uh, but since KMG's passed, like with him, I remember going to his place in Gardena, just like all these times I spent with those guys, you know, in the 90s, and it was just amazing to be around and to see, <clears throat> see what they did and I think KMG and Hutch had such a good partnership in the sense that they both uh, looked at the streets in the way of the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of uh, gangster rap, reality rap, street rap, street reporting, what have you, a lot of the stuff that I don't think is as good is the, I'm just gonna shoot you, kill you, whatever, whereas above the law, talked about the politics of it, yes. the politics of it, Uncle but, Sam's curse, Uncle is probably, Sam, yeah. <laughs> that's probably the best example of it, because that's probably, in my opinion, if not their best album, one of them, but. One of them, yeah, and, and, and not, to, not to cut you off of that, but like, to see, like, as much as people love Tupac, but I remember Tupac meeting Above the Law for the first time, and how he was lit up, oh, how yeah. he lit up to come in the room and was like, yo, Above the Law, he was so happy to smoke with KMG and, and Blaze and just like, he was just like, so that, uh, the song Call It What You Want that he was on. Black Mafia Life. Yep, we were all there and that's a whole nother thing, like being around and just seeing that, shout out to Money B and all, that's family right now. You know, all those people, we, you know, we grew now, we become family so many years, but like, to see those first days of them coming around and Pac with the chronic beanie coming in and just like, just this hype kid from Oakland, like, what's happening, yo, what's, man, smoke, roll up something, roll up something, yo, he like, I'm gonna studio with a bug of law. And I thought, like, later on, as he got famous and people started to, like, praise Tupac, I'm like, that's a trip because he praises, he used to praise Hutch in, in uh, KMG and, like, right. like, and respect them. So it just says a lot. And if you listen to some of his interviews, you'll hear him say, like, how much he respected cocaine and, like, yo, bro, the law. So um, it's inspiration is big, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You never know how it passes on to someone else, you know? Yeah, and that's... I'm glad we were talking about KMG in particular, but it's uh, Above the Law is very integral to a lot of major things that happen in rap. That's why in detail I talk about them in my book, The History of Gangster Rap, because they really took what, in my opinion, a lot of what Dre and Ruthless were doing was very bomb squatty, fast, aggressive, a lot of that, and Above the Law slowed it down and we saw that with Living Like Hustlers and then Vocally Pimpin' and then Black Mafia Life. <laughs> and then we get The Chronic. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's... Um, and you know the history behind that. Like, we, yeah. we, can, we can put it all out there. We, anybody that knows hip-hop history, you have to know that The Chronic comes from Black Mafia Life. It's no... no and Vocally Pimpin'. That, and Vocally Pimpin'. No, hand, no question about it. Snoop, you know, everybody knows how the tape got took and all that. It's, it's really real. So... Those things, but then shout out to shout out to G Dub, Warren G, everybody. But they, everybody know the real. Like you know, they used to be around Hutch when that product was being made. You know, um, the product got took, and it was it was it was creative. Dre them flipped it. They own. They, one thing I learned about hip hop, and I'll say this on that note, is that we all can have the same equipment. We all can have the same record. We're all gonna sample it different and chop it different. So I well, learned that. And, and that was my point because, or what I was gonna begin to is the sense that. You know, between EPMD and MC Breed, even NWA and Eazy-E, and of course Ice Cube, like 
so many people had used the same sample above the law in different parts, in different ways, right. in different different ways to flip it, different lyrics, different artists over it. So there's all these things going on to where it's just not a good or a bad thing. It's just chrono chronologically, that's how it happened. I mean, EPMD mm -hmm. was the first I remember hearing like those records used in a certain type of way mm -hmm. when you got to chill and different things. So and even how they flipped yeah. De La Soul, like a lot yeah. of those funk records, De La Soul would De La Soul did them consider too. like gangster. Like even East Coast records, I was telling Dane that like a lot of those records before it was really gangster rap, the gangsters were playing that music. You know what I mean? They were not they were playing Cinderella, they were playing, you know, yeah. nightmares and all that. So um yeah that's that's a trip man and I have something else talking about production as far the, the art of being an original sampler like we sample music but the art of being an original sampler you oh, yeah. have to be original creating cutting cut instead of just cutting and pasting because um producing now is so easy song uh, sounds right. are already filtered you get everything with these presets and it sounds awesome it's great but then you still lose the, the producers now don't understand how to flip in the crates and find that special sample and find that little piece they're just going off what's package they get well you know? back back that's back to the creativity because if you look at like a funky worm and then you look at all the people that use that song mm -hmm. in so many different ways and so many different parts of it and sped up slowed down mm -hmm. you know whatever <clears throat> it just shows you the difference of how people interpret the music how the samples are used differently and then of course we haven't even got to the who's rapping on top of it or <laughs> the, the or cadence that goes that on stuff. top. So it's just, it's it's endless. That goes back to do. KMG. Not that, but rest in peace, homie. But like hearing Black Superman and then to hear him, I hit the loot juice. Huh, yeah. pulls up in the dude. He gave me the scoop about the fake. It was just like, yo, and he set the whole tone. And then I remember going in and watch Hush put the, hey, this Hush, what's up? Then the whole little watch, you know, back then to put the skits together was fun because you had to go in and really do them. I mean, Almost like you're really shooting in the studio. Like the, the effects was real, man. The ad libs. Yeah, you couldn't just get those on. Uh, those sounds came later, but yeah. the, you couldn't just get those yeah. automatically. A like lot now. of that shit. Like take that. Hey, take that speaker outside. Let's go. Let's really do some shit. Like it was a lot of real effects back then, man. Right. So, and then uh, moving on with Battle Cat, um, the thing, and it applies to later with uh, Domino with yourself, and then with all the other things that he started doing soon thereafter, like Battle Cat, I think, like you, was showing this wide range of stuff he was doing because Domino had to sing songy flow. Mm -hmm. You know, he, uh, Battle Cat, of course, ended up getting more gangster, working with Dana Dane, working with you, working with all these different things. How did you notice Battle Cat was able to navigate, uh, and you working with him, how did you notice him navigating through a more of a, a singer type of thing versus a hardcore rapper versus a more of a fun rapper like Dana Dane. How did that work? Well, I watched Cat, you know, with the drum machine do the meat and potatoes, and I learned as a producer that to call in your secret weapons and know how to call in someone. So he, you know, Cat was in there doing something, and he, you know, you, you do something in another genre, and he would do where he was, get get out enough to where he was comfortable, but then he would call a Warren Campbell or call Butch Smalls or call someone in to come and, and, and layer and lace, pretty much lace the beat. But once again, being fearless as a producer and, and not being afraid to try different sounds, um, the art of being original when you sample. Cat is a great interpolator. He's, he's very good at interpolating something. So he can hear something and, and like give you that. One thing I did learn, and, and I'm sharing this <laughs> from Cat, that I learned a lot and I, I've applied it to my production style is that, you know, as a DJ, he take like a, a Buffalo Girls piece of Buffalo Girls and with a Herbie Hancock synth and replay that over and then put a bass line from George Benson and like you have like these elements and you're like, why do I fucking love this record? Because the bass line is from that and this other sound is from that and it's just he, the way he chops it, you're like, okay. You take your favorite elements out of songs and then uh, I learned how to, once again, talking about being uh, original with sampling, I really always loved the Al Green, uh, Love and Happiness. Mm. And I watched Cat one day and he was in there sampling, he was sampling, going through stuff and I was like, I need to figure this out. So he chopped, I forget what it was, it was he chopped his, his Brothers Johnson record up, he just chopped something up really dope. So I watched how he did it, I was like, got it, boom, went back in the room and I 
listened to the Al Green. I said, if I want this part, I'm going to have to listen to it very fast. So uh, Battle Cat and my other homeboy, <laughs> Butter. I learned how to sample really good from Butter. And I took that piece. Bing, bing, ding, 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 and I was able to put it on the pads. And I'm like, I fucking got it. I went crazy. I got it. So now I'm able to play this shit on the pad. Bing, 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 bing. And I was like, I got it. So just learning little techniques uh, from special people like that, man. Um, Cat is awesome. Um, fearless. Um, and a fusion guy, not afraid to uh, fuse genres together, so. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gang bang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always gonna be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.